Today we're going to be taking an in-depth look inside the notorious Hyundai Theta 2 engine and all its troubles. Now this engine is a 2.4 liter version out of a 2012 Hyundai Sonata. Now we don't really know too much history behind it other than it is missing an oil pan and it was seized up at some point. Now taking a look across the top of this motor here you can see we've got a plastic valve cover with the four individual coil packs making it for easy spark plug changes. We have also got the gasoline direct injected fuel pump over here because this only has direct injection only. Now coming around the back side of the engine here you can see we've got this big coolant terminus here where coolant's going to flow out of the head and also come across from the water pump located over here. We've got our thermostat located here and of course I like how Hyundai's put in these eyelets here because they know you're going to have to change the engine how often it fails. Now the Theta 2 does use a double overhead cam design with variable valve timing on both the exhaust and the intake side. We've got a timing chain underneath this cover here which means that you're not supposed to service it over the life of this engine which is pretty short anyways and you can see off the front here we do have a belt driven water pump. We're going to begin the teardown by removing these four coil packs and I'm going to pop off these spark plugs here. Now check out all the white cross on the tip of these spark plugs. And before I can remove the valve cover I got to remove the connection to the gasoline direct injection fuel pump. Just use this wrench here to loosen it off. Now this here was also the subject of one of the recalls on this engine where this wasn't tightened down properly causing fuel to leak all over the engine and it could catch a fire. And remove this fuel tube here. Now the gasoline direct injected fuel pump is driven off of the exhaust camshaft. There's a special lobe inside of here that moves it up and down in order to pump high pressure fuel down into your fuel injectors. So just remove these bolts here. And then I can remove that pump. You can see here there's a spring on it that pushes up and down against that lobe. Finally now I'm going to remove all the 10 millimeter bolts that hold the valve cover on. Just pry open that valve cover. This thing feels so crusty and brittle. And that's what it looks like from underneath. It's just a simple molded part with this oil baffle here to separate. Because you've got your PCV valve over here and this other ventilation valve over here. Now since the bottom end's already been taken apart, this isn't going to make a full revolution. But it's not seized either like they said it would be. I do see that the timing chains are still connected. Although there's a little bit of slop in the timing chain here. Now a lot of manufacturers put a timing chain guide over here to prevent this from slopping around. But it seems like Hyundai is kind of skimmed on this engine. I'm going to remove the crank bolt. Now next up I'm going to remove this timing chain cover. Although it looks like there's a couple of bolts behind this water pump. So maybe I'll pull out this pulley first. Bunch of 10s and 12s hold this timing chain cover on. This is just an aluminum piece here. There's nothing to it other than being a cover. Now taking a look at this very simple valve train, you've got your crankshaft at the bottom here with your timing chain that leads up to your double overhead cams. The cams on the exhaust and the intake side are both variable valve timing. That's why they're so big. You can see this is the return spring inside the exhaust side. The chains themselves, I noticed there's enough tension on them so I don't think there was a timing chain issue or a slip or a breakage. You've got a plastic slide over here that operates with this hydraulic tensioner. And then on this side you've got another plastic timing chain guide. Now down at the bottom here you do have a secondary timing chain that's going to power the oil pump which was missing along with the oil pan on this engine. Now unlike a lot of engines I do like how Hyundai's put the water pump off to the side here and not run off the timing chain itself that way you don't have to mess with that if you've got to replace this. This is just driven off the serpentine belt. And hanging off the back here is the oil control valve for the exhaust variable valve timing. You see it's just a simple solenoid. And over here is the intake variable valve timing solenoid. You can see I actually broke it off and it's stuck inside of this engine here. Next I'm going to start removing these tensioners here so we can take off the timing chains. Now you can see there's oil inside so we know this guy was operating properly. This is where things start to get a little oily so I just use a piece of my wife's old t-shirt here that got chewed up in the washing machine. And just sap up some of that oil here and just remove this timing chain slide here. And this one over here. And now I can remove the timing chain itself. And I think this is pretty interesting. There's this little squirt over here that comes off of the oil galley inside of the engine. That squirts oil on the timing chains to keep them lubricated. It's a small little tube passage like that. At least the crankshaft and camshafts are keyed. It's from like that Ford Mazda engine I took apart. Now I'm going to remove the exhaust cam gear. And the intake gear. I'm slide those gears off and you can see these holes on the back here where the oil is going to flow through the camshaft itself. Now that the timing is taken care of we're going to move to the head here and remove these camshafts. 
This is just a holder piece for the direct injection pump. Here you can see the load for the direct injection pump. Now here's a little cylinder that sits inside this pump housing that goes up and down. You can see there's actually a bearing surface on the inside here. Now this cylinder here is going to ride on this cam lobe over here. And it's also got a little roller underneath, so it's basically going to be moving up and down. Now I'm going to remove all these cam cap cover bolts here. And just lift this off here. Take off these caps. Now one thing you'll notice at the top of this engine here that there's no rocker arms. It's just a direct cam on valve action where it just presses down directly on these buckets here. You've also got your intake and exhaust camshaft sensors here. So these head bolts are actually a triple square M12. Wow. Hi. So as we're able to remove all of the head bolts except the two ones here at the front, my socket is too large to go into these recess holes. I don't know why Hyundai didn't just drill this out a little bit bigger to give me some more clearance with a standard triple square socket. Now perhaps one of the biggest drawbacks of the Theta 2 engine is the fact that it has gasoline direct injection only, which means that the gas only goes down directly into the cylinder head and it skips the intake valves, which means there's no chance to wash off these intake valves and they're going to get clogged up with carbon, as you can see here. You can see just how black those intake valves are. You can barely even make out the valves themselves. Everything's just all covered up with carbon and soot. And this is the stuff that you probably have to get walnut blasted in order to get it back to be clean. Otherwise, you're going to start restricting the airflow and your engine's going to run very poorly. Next, I'm going to remove the 12 millimeter bolts that hold this fuel rail on. Now this fuel rail has to take high pressure fuel, that's why it's built so solid because it's being pressurized and sent directly into the heads themselves. Port injectors can just sit directly on the intake and don't need all this fancy stuff. Here's another sore spot, the knock sensors. We've actually updated the software so that the knock sensor starts to sense when the engine is about to blow up and give you a warning. Now moving over to the back side of the engine here, you can see you've got the thermostat housing as well as this entire water control assembly here with your coolant temperature sensor. Now one thing I don't like is it's all made of plastic, except the tube that comes in from the water pump. So I wonder what would happen when that heats up in a couple of hundred heat cycles. Let's remove the thermostat itself here. There's the thermostat and as I said this thing is so brittle it just broke right off. And here's the thermostat that sits inside of here. Gotta remove this water jacket cooling assembly here. Oh man, there's a coolant mess. Very right, big mess calls for my wife's shirt again. Wipe that up. Next I'm going to remove the water pump and the water pump housing from the block here. It's a bunch of 12 millimeters. That's what the pump assembly looks like. Got two inlets over here and of course your big outlet over there. And that corresponds to the water cooling jacket which is inside around the piston. And this here is where the crank position sensor is located. It reads right off the crankshaft. Now since I'm still waiting on the tool for those two head bolts, we're going to go ahead and flip this over here. Time to make a mess. Got another one of my wife's dress for this concrete. Now over here at the bottom end you can see I do have the oil pan missing. Now the main flaw in these engines here is that they chew up bearings. And that's due to the deburring process in the manufacturing where they've left some particles inside of these engines. And then the oil is going to pick it up and try to push it through the passages. Some bearings are going to get starved, other bearings are just going to get chewed up. And then your engine starts knocking or seizes up. So you can see the previous one has already removed the connecting rod caps. The pistons are down here and I can already see that the bearings here look pretty chewed up. So I'm going to remove all of these 14 millimeter 12 point bolts here so we can have a look at the crankshaft. Yeah, this bearing has got some signs of scoring on it. This one's got a couple of lines on it, but it's not as bad. Alright, now I'm going to lift the crankshaft out of here. Now with the crankshaft removed, I'll use a piece of my brother's old cotton t-shirt because cotton works the best to absorb all this oil here so we can have a closer look at the bearing surfaces. Now taking a look at some of the bearing surfaces, you can see that the main bearings haven't really been affected too bad by the lack of oil and lubrication caused by those debris inside of there. However, the connecting rods, even though these aren't even the bearing surfaces, do look quite worn with this cylinder number one here being the worst. As a matter of fact, you can see just how many grooves there are. I can actually feel them with my wife's little toothbrush. And you can see that this here is like 
tarnished because it's got like a darkish kind of color compared to the connecting rods that are beside it so we can tell that this one definitely suffered from lack of lubrication and it actually overheated and this is probably what caused the engine to seize up because there's actually no more lubrication behind here and it just kind of melts all together and becomes one piece with the crankshaft now we're just going to wait for the m12 triple square socket tool so we can pull off the head and then we'll have a look at the rest all right so i was able to get a long m12 triple square socket here I'll put that in and break this last head bolt free and we'll just zip out these head bolts all right and i'll just lift off this engine head here and here we've got the head gasket spin this guy over so now that the entire engine is apart, we're going to have a quick look at all of these components to see how they work. Now we're going to start here with the block, and that's because the oil pan and oil filter assembly, as well as the oil pump is missing. So we can only assume that oil is going to be supplied somehow from that unit down inside of here to the main oil galley. Now the main oil galley is located inside of here, this slight cylindrical thing. You can also see they've got a couple of oil sprayers here. It's going to spray and lubricate the inside of the liners. Now turning the block over to the front here, you can see where that main oil galley runs along here and you've got this oil pressure sensor located over here. Now looking here at the timing side, you can see where that main galley is. You've got this galley that's going to come off here and feed the hydraulic tensioner for the chain. And you've also got another one that's going to come up here and feed the main bearings through these holes here. Now speaking about main bearings, the crankshaft bearings in general don't look too bad on this engine with the exception of this one here in the middle. Taking a look here, you can see that this bearing is quite worn out. There's a lot of grooves inside of here, but all the rest of the bearings look okay. Now taking a look at the crankshaft here, which is where most of the damage is, you can see that this bearing surface here is very rough, whereas the main bearing surface is a little bit more smooth. And if you look at the one of the rod bearings here, you can see that it's actually chewed up and the coating is coming off of it. And if you take a look at the ends of the crankshaft near this connecting rod bearing, and compare it to all of the other bearings here, you'll notice that this one here is a little bit more darker in color and also the number one piston which corresponds to it the bottom of it is completely dark compared to say another piston here which is light and in any case that there's a lot of heat between this connecting rod here as well as the crankshaft and that's due to this bearing either sliding and spinning or it just completely locking up due to lack of lubrication now the real reason why the Theta 2 Hyundai and Kia motors are failing is because when they were manufacturing these parts they didn't properly deburr them and you've got extra pieces of machine particles that are now going to be floating around in the oil and then that's going to block all those oil passages that we saw in the block and then you no longer have lubrication going to this bearing. Now two things could happen. You have heat buildup, which is what you see here, and that's because there's so much friction between the two. The connecting rod bearing itself could actually spin in its spots instead of being like this it could actually rotate like this and now you've got a gap on the bottom there so when you rev the engine you're going to hear knocking sounds or it could completely seize up causing the engine to seize and then that's what's going to cause the whole engine to seize up while you're driving down the road. Now the biggest problem is how Hyundai and Kia handled the recall despite knowing about the issue these engines are almost 10 years old now they still didn't address it until recently when the National Highway Safety and Transportation Association kind of flagged them and told them hey if the engine's seizing up then that's actually a safety issue and you need to take care of it. It was only until recently owners were not being compensated for a pretty much a big engine rebuild because you've got to get down to remachining the crankshafts and replacing the connecting rods and all the bearings in between in order to correct this issue properly. Now also looking at the top of these pistons here you can see that there's a lot of carbon buildup on the top here. Next we're going to take a look at the engine head here and once again you can see that there are a lot of oil passages such as these holes over here and these ones that feed your variable valve timing gears underneath here and those also could be affected by the particles moving around in the engine. As a matter of fact if you take a look at this camshaft here you can see that there's a lot of scoring here and that's again due to lack of lubrication or all those particles inside of there acting like little pieces of sand scratching away at these smooth surfaces. In terms of overall design Hyundai does have a fairly simple layout there's actually no rocker arms inside of here but the camshafts directly acting down on the bucket which pushes the valve down. Everything is pretty simple you got your four spark plugs which are pretty easy to access. The only thing that's a little bit interesting is the gasoline direct injection located down here. Now there's always been a big debate on having gasoline direct injected engines only and the reason for that is when you've injected the gasoline down directly inside of the cylinder head here it's going to give you more power which is great 
per EPA ratings or fuel economy, but it's not good for the engine itself. Because take a look inside of here, you can see just how black these ports are. They're completely full of carbon. Now if you have the injectors on top of the intake valve, it'll be able to wash those valves down and you have a much cleaner intake port, so you wouldn't have any restrictions and you wouldn't have to clean this out periodically. And here's another look at the bottom of the cylinder head here. Again, you can see where the injectors are going to inject fuel over here into the combustion chamber. Now the cylinder head does use an open deck design, which means that there's no reinforcement between the cylinder wall and the cylinder itself. It's just the coolant jacket that runs all along. And if you look at the same thing over here on the block, you can see that coolant jacket going all the way around and your inlet here that comes in from the water pump to push coolant through the system. And taking a look here, you can see you've got your exhaust ports. What's interesting is there's actually a little separator over here that separates the two exhaust ports for the single cylinder until it comes to the exhaust manifold. Now this is an older design where you have individual exhaust ports coming out into a manifold externally. Other engines will actually take this and integrate it into one exhaust port which would then lead directly to the catalytic converter or the turbochargers. And that's pretty much an in-depth look inside the Hyundai and Kia Theta 2 motor. Now if you do have one of these engines in your vehicle there's not really much you can do about it since it could just start consuming oil all of a sudden or making knocking sounds. You just got to make sure that you're really topped up on oil very frequently and check out the recall to see if you're really covered. Make sure you follow me on Instagram for more behind the scenes footage and subscribe for more videos just like this one.